Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. I'm Laura Jones and in this session I'm speaking with ultra running legend and coach Carl Meltzer. Carl, nicknamed Speed Goat Carl, has had 62 ultra wins and has many other records to his name, including the most 100 mile trail race wins on earth, the most 100 mile wins in a calendar year, 17 years in a row winning at least 100 miler and a total of 42 100 mile race wins. All this together makes Carl the winningest 100 mile runner on earth. Uh, Carl has held speed records at major US trails, including the Appalachian Trail and the Pony Express Trail. He's the current race director for the Speed Goat 50K and has been a coach since 2007. Carl runs for Hocco Neoni, Dry Max Socks, Ultra Spiral Hydration, First Endurance Racing Nutrients, Squirrels Nut Butter, and Speed Goat Carl's 100 Mile Blend of Coffee. Apparently, he's also currently speaking to be a sponsor, so if anyone out there is interested, then do let us know. Uh, Carl's 52, lives in Sandy, Utah. Carl, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Laura. Um, yeah, the beer sponsor offer is still out there. Everyone yeah. needs a beer sponsor. So. We will let you know if we get any uh, anybody who's looking to take you up on that, for sure. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so before we get into um, the more detailed question, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your background, Carl, and how your running journey started. Uh, well, I'm, so I'm 52 years old. I moved to Utah in 1989 to ski bum. I, I ran in high school. I didn't finish college, but I ran in high school, you know, that type of thing. I was decent at it, but I wasn't really like the best, fastest guy around, but I did all right. And then I moved to Utah to be ski bum in 89, planned on moving back to New Hampshire where I'm from originally, and then uh, decided that was a bad idea and then stayed in Utah. And then I real, basically just started running around the mountains just for fun, you know. But I sort of realized I was pretty good at it pretty quickly and started entering shorter races. Never thought I'd run um, a trail marathon. The first big sort of big event that I ran was the Pikes Peak Marathon or Pikes Peak Ascent actually. And I said, why would you want to run down the mountain? But then it kind of caught on and I did, then I ran that. And then a friend of mine who I used to work with at Snowbird uh, just suggested I run the Wasatch 100. And that was like, why would I want to do that? But <laughs> Like anything else, you know, I'm, but I'm always up for a challenge. So I, I entered, it was my first ultra marathon. And of course my only goal was, I had that initial goal to finish. I mean, I think that's important for anyone going to their first hundred is like the goal should be to finish. A time, a time goal is, that's all great and everything, but you have no clue what it's going to feel like. So, uh, so that was my goal. Um, I finished it in 96. I, you know, I made a mistake. I went out too fast as most people kind of do. Uh, I was leading the race in mile 40 and then the wheels sort of started to, Started to come off, um, but I finished. Um, said I'd never do it again, and then two days later, I was like, "Where do you sign up?" Which is a common thing. From that from that point on, it sort of just escalated into, you know, every year was the Wasatch 100, and then and then it became like, what other races are tough? And training in the Wasatch Mountains, where I live, in near Salt Lake, the mountains are very rugged, they're very steep, um, very technical. So that was became sort of my wheelhouse. So I started to focus on um, just running races that. You know, matched my my training ground, so to speak. I wouldn't go run around a track for 24 hours if you're training here; it's no fun. Uh, so I just, you know, I just started doing it. And once I won my first race in '98, which was the Los Angeles 100, I kind of took it from there and said, "Well, how can I make a living at this?" And at the time, no one's really going to make a living at ultra running. I think I get paid 500 bucks a year. You know, like that buys you some groceries for a month, right? Uh, it escalated over a little time, and. Um, here we are 20 years later. I never thought it would be 2020, but, uh, you know, my career has been 20, I guess about 24 years long and I'm still kicking. Yeah. And yeah, I, I would like to say that you're the first person that I've um, introduced as a legend. Well, you, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an honor to be called a legend. Um, but you know, I really just look at, I've always had my life. I've always treated my life as just do what I want to do. And, uh, you know, live once, die later kind of thing. I'm not a dangerous, I don't live dangerously by any means. Um, I ski a little too fast sometimes, but but uh, other than that, it's uh, I just did what I wanted to do. So I sort of worked my way to making a career out of it. And now, obviously, being a coach in 2007, that's helped. Um, sponsorships have changed over the years in terms of, like, financial income. I mean, it's still, you know, it's still, nobody's getting rich out here. But, um, but you can live off, if you're, these, you know, high level sponsored athlete, you can live off running. So, um, so I just found a way to do that. And, you know, I like to say I'm retired. I'm not retired, but um, I like to say I'm retired. I've been saying I was retired since I was 20. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I lived that kind of life of retirement, you know, with hardly working that much. 
and just doing what I love to do. Yeah, well, it doesn't feel too much like work then, does it? Well, if it doesn't, yeah, if it doesn't feel like you're going to work, then I think you're successful in, in some form. Yeah. Nobody yeah. likes to get up and go work for the man and not enjoy it. <laughs> exactly. So um, you know, do what you want to do. So I'm um, trying to understand your sort of motivations for these incredible things you've done, you know, the Appalachian Trails over 2,000 miles. And um, what, what are your motivations? What has made you drive what made you drive forward to to do all these incredible races and these you know incredible feats of human endurance what was it that drove you well, well I've, I, what drives me forward really is just that you know i like being out in the mountains i mean nowadays i'm not as fast as i used to be so but i still like to be out there i think the initial when i started just running in the mountains of utah in the early 90s i mean i was and if you have, i'm sure you may not have ever been to utah but for some of those people who have been out west in 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 Utah, Colorado, you get out in the mountains, there's wildflowers, there's mountain goats, there's deer, whatever, you know, um, it's beautiful. So I was just like, I wasn't even thinking I was training for anything. I just, I just went out and it was nice. Um, but the motivation comes from just liking to be out there. I mean, it doesn't matter how fast I am anymore because I've never, never raced like I used to. But um, when that, when I started realizing that, well, you're pretty good at this, um, and it's sort of like, well, the, the, you know, the competition starts stirring in your head. Like, what can I do? And what, so with all the years as I've gone by, when I won the Hard Rock 100 in 2001 um, and set a record there at that time, um, no one thought it would ever be broken, right? Well, now it's four hours faster. Killing Jermaine has the record, um, which is incredible, you know. Um, but after that race, I think I said, well, what's in a wheelhouse? And that's obviously technical terrain. But then I started chasing um, – 100 mile wins, you know. Once I got to about 15, then I was like, well, I'm close to, and getting closer to Ann Trayson, who, I, who had the record at the time. So once I finally chased that, I got to that point, and then I sort of wanted to, what do I do to raise the bar? And that was winning 600s in a year. That was 2006. That was raising the bar for me. And what do I do next to raise the bar? Because now I did that. I'm like, well, what am I going to do now? So the Appalachian Trail came about. And that's, you know, it's almost 2,200 miles. 500,000 feet of vertical climb. It's a really hard trail if anyone's ever been on it. And uh, that was my next raising the bar. And that was what kept, kept me motivated. Yeah. And the first try in 2008, I didn't succeed, but I got to go do 2,200 miles of supported effort where every day, I mean, I'm all taken care of. All I had to do was, you know, jog and walk and jog and run and fast and whatever. Um, that was priceless. So I was just like kind of, in you know, La La Land, just knowing that I had all these I had great ability, but I had people supporting me. So it's pretty easy to be motivated when people stand behind you like that. And then, you know, and then just chasing those 100 mile records. Now it's like, now it's my record. So every time I, every time I win, if I still win another one, um, and I'm going to try next week again, but uh, everybody says you're going to go for the record. I said, it doesn't matter what the time is. If I win, it's still a record. I just want to make a living doing it, you know, instead of, I don't want to work for someone else. Yeah. Coaching, I work for myself, and, and that's still work, but it's not, not, it's not punching the punch clock, you know, it's not being on salary. So it's, I, I, I live in a dream world. I mean, don't kid yourself. I said that. And, uh, you know, what can I say? I've been very lucky. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, uh, uh, there's more to luck. I mean, to, to you, 2006, did you say you won 600 mile races in the. Yeah, that was the year that I won six of them in the one calendar year. And I won four. Was in, in a period of eight weeks. Wow. So if there was a hot, if there was the best, you know, period of my ultra career, that that eight week span was probably was probably the best. And I even entered another one a couple weeks later when I was leading the race at mile forty. So I couldn't have seven, but um, there it, there was such a storm came in they actually canceled the race mid race. Wow. Winds were blowing. The tent was off the mountain, but that's another story. But uh, I was just you know I was in really good shape right there. My headspace was really good, and I was just. It's kind of just on fire. So, but since then, I've just, uh, you know, I've still had a great career since then, no doubt about it. But uh, chasing those six in a year is, it's, it's going to be hard for someone to beat that one. Amazing. Um, and do you find, you know, you've had this, this career that spanned over 20 years. Do you think um, becoming an ultra runner has um, affected the way you tackle other areas of your life and the way you approach other things? 
Um, I, I think so. I think, like I said, I'm, I'm a very laid back person. I don't let things, I don't worry about things too much because like of all those hundred miles I've run, which is about 75 or 80 of them, um, only about five of them were perfect, you know, like had really, really were perfect. So that being said, when you have bad patches, I can just kind of laugh it off and well, whatever. It's like that with all my life when like today, for instance, uh, it's snowing here and I'm used to running in the snow, not a big deal. But it's a little hard to, harder to motivate to get out the door. I still haven't run today. I'm going to shortly, but um, I just kind of like, oh, whatever. You know, I had a story written about me one time in Trail Runner magazine, and it was called The Whatever Man. And and it was just classic because uh, Garrett Robbins, the guy who wrote the story, I, I've kind of known him for a long time, and he, he wrote this great story about how I just don't worry about stuff that much. And that's how... Running, I mean, running, I don't worry. If, if I don't win next week, whatever, I'm going to, like, go home and be like, okay, and I'll start doing something else, you know. So I don't worry about stuff much. I think that's really important. Um, I focus on things. If I, if I, whether it's running or whether it's, when I was bartending at Snowbird, for instance, um, you know, I, sure, I was working for the man. I was punching the punch clock. But when I set my bar up and things like that, I was very focused on doing it properly. I, went, I didn't just go half-ass things. And that's just how I am. When I build things, I'm very precise. Um, just how I live my life. And I think ultra running has, you got to be precise if you're going to, to do things by yourself like that. You know, I don't rely on others. I don't have pacers. I don't, sometimes I have crew, my wife will crew me, but when I don't have a crew, um, it makes me focus even more. Just I run my best races without crew, actually. Just, I don't tell my wife that, but, but uh, she knows, she knows, she'd be laughing too if you heard that. But, uh, but that's how I, my life is sort of like ultra running. I just like let it ride and see what happens tomorrow. Um, just roll with it. Yeah, it works. Works for you. That's good. And, um, it's working, so yeah. <laughs> and what about? Um, I'm sure that you said that you know only a small number of those races you could say have been perfect. What can you tell us about uh, maybe your your greatest mistake or your greatest failure and what you learned from it? Um. Hmm. Well, I think. When you do a lot of 100 milers, um, you learn that not everything's going to go perfectly. When you build something, not everything's going to go just right. I learned the hard way in just about anything. <laughs> um, I'm kind of stubborn in a way because I'll build something even at my house and I'll look on how to do it, but then I'll kind of screw it up and it's frustrating. <laughs> but uh, I, just learned from, I just learned from that kind of stuff. And what about your... Um biggest influences you know in terms of other people or you know um you know over the course of your career or any documentaries books that sort of thing anything that's had a big impact on you or your running well i mean not you know honestly not too many people have really influenced me over a lot of things i sort of like i said i learned the hard way and i kind of go suffer as is the first time we did the at and this is a good example in 2008 i brought this idea up to backcountry.com um, hey, what if I did the AT next year? We did a blog. We gave up prizes. We will track me. Um, I went into that one and learned the hard way. So you don't want to do the AT with a with a with a um, an RV because it doesn't it doesn't work. It's too complicated for the crew. Um, that that helped me learn about it. Um, but nobody really influenced me. Like I didn't say I want to be like him. Want to be like her. I just kind of said, well. That's kind of, maybe I said, that's kind of cool. I'll give it a try. That's what I did. It took me three tries to get the AT record, you know. Um, it's just how I am. I, I, I'm very self-centered. I don't know if that's good or bad sometimes. But, uh, you know, no, and runners really haven't, really haven't influenced me. I mean, I watch running. I, I love watching running. A lot of people say it's the most boring thing, too. But I love it because I do it. When I watch golf. I love it because I do it. They, they, those, you know, motivational people influence me, but it's not, I don't know, it's a, it's a tough answer for me because I, I just kind of do things on my own and let it ride. If I influence other people, I try to do it in a positive way as, as possible, you know. Yeah. I'm never guy that's going to be, that wins a race and walks away and say, okay, I can't talk to you. I'm like, that's not me. I will hang out and watch the end of the pack every time. Yeah. I other people motivation. I like that. I mean, if you go to Leadville 100 the last hour, people are bawling coming across the finish line. You know, it's pretty hilarious yeah in a, in a good way you know yeah yeah i can i can influence people to just live live an easier life and not get so stressed out about making money because you can't bring it with you when you're dead when you're dead you're dead right so at least that's all I um so i just kind of live off what i have and, and uh don't let anybody really tell me what to do 
Yeah. And it's really, um, it's really struck me having spoken to quite a lot of you now, how um, the community within ultra running is so, it's such a unique thing. It, it really is like almost like a family, isn't it? Well, yeah, we like to, you know, we like to see people succeed, you know, and, and again, like, when, like I mentioned, I like to see the back of the pack come in. Those are the, those are the motivational people. I mean, to me anyway, you know, I mean, whenever most of the hundred miles that I finished were one or two in the morning is the race director might be there. He might be sleeping in his truck. Nobody's there, but those people at the end of the pack are the real people that um, we want to see successful. And I'll, I'll go out and help anybody. Like another person, if someone wants to go try to break the AT record, you know, I'd, I'd be totally happy to help them. I helped Scott Jurek in 2015 when he did it and he broke the record and not just because I wanted to learn about my 2016 attempt. It was because Scott's a friend, you know, he's a good friend of mine. And it's like, it was cool to help him, you know. Um, Dave Horton came and helped me. He, he said the same thing too. It was like, we like to see others be successful. And that's just, I don't want to see people fail, you know. So what if it's my record? It gets broken. It's fine, you know, good job. Yeah. Um, when my record went down at Hard Rock, it was broken about three hours again. A kid named Kyle Skaggs destroyed it. And I was like the first person there to congratulate him, you know. I think it's great to, to see people break records. We compete with others. I have a lot of friends that have been in the top of this field, in top of the sport, and we're all friends. And it's, when it's race day, it's race day. You know, we're racing. I'll push them off the trail, you know. <laughs> Maybe not. But, uh, you know, but it's, it's all in food. It's all in good fun. At the end, we have some beers. We hang out. It's all good. Um, and you mentioned that you're going to have another bash at them. Um that 100 miler next week um what um what are you going to be focusing on this year in 2020 well so that it's called the cold water rumble it's not a really big race but it's in arizona it's on dirt and as i mentioned it's snow here so it's winter it's full on winter here so it's nice to get down to the desert and do something different and i think i'll do that race i'll run antelope island 100 i'll run kettle moraine 100 i'll run superior 100 uh, and there'll be something after that i'm not sure yet but I, I focus on hundreds now because I'm getting slower. So, you know, to run a 50K to me is sort of, I'm not going to say it's not worth the time, but um, it's not, you know, at least at least in my head. I, I need to go up to the hundred. So I'll, I'll focus on that. Uh, but mostly I'll focus on trying to stay healthy. I mean, as we get older, I don't recover as, like I used to. I, I can't train as hard as I used to. I mean, I don't train as hard as some people think. I, my effort, my effort training is hard enough, but but I don't run 100 miles a week. I run like 50, which isn't. People would say that's not very much to run hundreds, but I know how to run 100. Yeah. Off the couch, I can just go do it. You know, um, I can get it done. I won't be, won't be very fast, but I can get it done. I'll just focus on doing that. You know, I hope my wife. She, I hope my wife crew at a few races. Um, I work a few races where I do aid stations. Um, I put on my Spigo 50k race, and that's. You know, that's for about a month. That's a big job. Um, so just just try to stay in the community, keep doing what I love to do. You know, and and, and also probably hit the white ball a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, you, you know, what about? I mean, you mentioned there that mainly your goal now is to stay healthy. Um, you know, normally in these interviews, I would ask people, you know, if they had any sort of long term goals that they were things they were hoping to achieve during their career. But I mean, yours already reads like you know it's unbelievable really so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um i mean you know it, like you say i suppose now just to say that you just want to stay in the sport and stay healthy would be the ultimate goal really well you know there, there's one record out there that i'm still chasing um it's not like my most direct focus but janos koros who is deemed the greatest ultra of all, all time and i agree for for on full on but he's won 46 times at 100 miles or more I'm at 42, so I'm not far behind him. Um, both of us have really different skill sets. And Giannis is, when it comes to track and road, he is the greatest ever. And I don't think anyone's in my lifetime is ever going to beat his records. 188 miles in 24 hours is just come nearly remotely close to that in a long, long time. And he's done that multiple times. So it's a different field. But, but just like if you were to hold the record on the Appalachian Trail, whether it's you go northbound or southbound, the record is whichever way you go, you know? So, like, if I do actually get past Giannis Koros, um, it's still the most 100-mile wins, you know, whether it's track or road or trail or whatever. And I definitely – I mean, I, I get crushed on the road or track. It kills me. But, you know, technical trail, it's different. So that, that record is kind of sitting out there. 
Um, and then I do plan to do the Appalachian Trail with my wife in a few more years. We, we plan on it. It's, it's a pretty big endeavor. We're just going to backpack it like normal, normal people. But it takes five or six months, you know. Uh, so that'll be a few years down the road. That's something I want to do just because um, it's a special place, that trail. You can feel – you walk on that trail. I don't care if you're in Jersey or Maine or Georgia. You walk on that trail and it just, you kind of feel the vibe of just a, being such a beautiful place in the woods. So that's just – those things are on my radar. But, again, like you said, I mean, just staying healthy and not having to, like – disappear from the sport because of an injury or something like that, that would kind of suck. Yeah. Um, I just want to kind of fade out, you know, slowly to survive. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, can you tell, you mentioned before that you uh, typically somewhere around a 50 mile um, a week would be about what you run. Can you tell us, uh, you know, roughly what a typical week looks like to you training wise and how you fit it in? Well, yeah, a typical week for me is, so, I mean, I'll run some weeks in the 60 to 70 range. It really sort of depends. I'm like, what I've always told my clients, too, is that, you know, we have these weekly mileage goals a lot of times, and our, we're focused on, you know, 50 miles per week, 60 miles per week, and when Sunday, it's mon I, I do it Monday to Sunday, so let's just say Sunday is your last day. I'm not going to cram in 23 miles on my last day just to make that weekly mileage because your body doesn't know what a week is. Right? Your body knows what you is now, right? Now. It doesn't even know what it is going to be in an hour, really. So weekly mileage is really just sort of a, a gauge. And then you can look at average after a whole year, say I average 52 or I average 65 or whatever. So I'll, I, I run on feel a lot. 20% um, of the time I probably run fairly hard. It really depends on how I feel. If I feel crappy and I, I'm planning to go hard and I feel crappy, I won't run hard. I'll just like, this is not the day for it. Mm -hmm. I listen to my body and, and tell myself, Okay, now's the time to push the pace or not push the pace. Um, but long runs, the longest run I'll do in a week might be maybe 20. Um, that's, I'd rather go run a 50K just for the hell of it, just as a training run in a race situation. I just, you get supported, it's more fun. But uh, I don't over, over myself on longer runs. Um, like I said, 20 will be the longest. My longest run before this next 100 is 16, and that was just a few days ago. But... I've done 100 mile 75 times, so, so I don't need that long run. That underlying base, I think, is strong enough for me. But for most people, I think it's important to do a, long, a reasonable long run every seven to ten days. You know, and that, again, it doesn't always have to be Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. But that's, that's what's convenient for most, right? So that's why we're all focused on this week thing. But if you can actually not think about Monday through Sunday, just think about today or tomorrow, in my role, I can do that because I work for myself, right? But um, it's important to really listen to your body. Like if I'm, like I said, if I'm hurting something, I'm hungover. <laughs> I'll wait till the afternoon to run or something. Um, that's not, it's not very often, but uh, it's for me. It's about listening to my body and knowing what I feel like. That day, you know, sometimes I'll even if I feel like I'm gonna, I'll probably do seven or eight miles today, but. Because I have a race, I won't go extra long. But if it was say I didn't have a race and I felt great, I I keep going. You know, um, probably I could do fifteen or eighteen, and you don't really need much fuel for that. You can run for a couple hours on nothing. Um, and if I get tired, I need some food. I can just tell myself to shut up and get to the finish, and you can eat when you get home. <laughs> yeah, quite. I tell myself into things. I'm I'm very mentally strong like that. Uh, yeah. That's just how I how I do it. But I think. For different levels of runners, um, if you're brand new to the sport and you want to run a hundred miler, you know, you don't go out and start running 70 miles a week. You'll you probably get hurt. Your chances of getting hurt are very high. So you sort of have to, if you have a coach or not, whether you have a coach or not, it's you have to start slow and build your miles up and build your body to get used to the rigors of the, you know, um, taking advice from someone is great. You, you learn from that, but you, you really learn from doing it. I, I said I learned the hard way, I said it again, but I learned it all from doing it. I didn't go to school to learn exercise physiology to get all those things. I just went out and learned the hard way, and now, I have, now I've got some pretty sound advice for, for getting through hundreds, and that's that most of it's between your ears after mile 40. Yeah. Even if you're doing 30 miles a week, it might sound crazy, but you can probably finish 100. It's just my wife, my wife is a classic experiment because – the girl hardly runs. I mean, she goes, she goes out with her friends two, twice a week. She exercises here and there, but she's finished a few hundred milers. 
And, you know, she's not an elite runner. She's, you know, more to the back of the pack. But uh, she's living proof that you can do it on all in your head. It's all about listening to your body and, uh, and not overtraining yourself. And the last thing is, like, to get elite runners, like, some of the best in our country, you know, those guys are probably banging up 70, 80, 100 miles a week. We're all older, you know, and you get older, you go slower. You just got to listen to your body and figure it out. And do you find, um, you know, because obviously you've had this um, career that spanned, you know, two decades, three decades. Um, and over that time, um, approaches to training, now all this data that we have access to and things like that. Uh, has that changed your approach to your training? Are you, do, you, do you look at the, Are you a data man? Do you, do you look at it and do you use it? <laughs> no, I'm not a data man. I, I mean, the, the funny thing is about the data is... Uh, so in 2010, when I ran the Pony Express Trail, I was with Red Bull. I don't have Red Bull anymore, but they were awesome. So no complaints there. But we did some testing up in Park City. You know, they put me on a treadmill and checked my lactate threshold, do all these, you know, all the tests. And I was found to be most efficient at, seven, I think, 7.4 miles an hour, which is only about an 8, 20 mile, eight, something like that. So it's not very, not very fast, right? But I could have told them that, you know, without going through all the data, right? Yeah, about 820s, I'm, I'm, it's autopilot. Um, the, but the data can be really good. But I think with, with my type of running in, in the mountains, up and down, technicality, terrain, you can't, it's not like you can stay in a certain heart rate zone um, at, the, at the same spot all the time, unless you're running around a track at a, in a very controlled environment. It's really hard to train with the heart rate zone thing, I think. Anyway, you, can use the, you can use it and look at it and learn from it maybe. But, uh, but generally speaking, I mentioned earlier that, you know, 20% of my days are probably harder. And this is just on average. But, you know, 40, 40 days are 40% easier and 40% is kind of like, eh, I feel, you know, I just cruise. So and that's, and if you look at all the, you know, a lot of the, the data and the research and all that, that's roughly what they say to do. But I've kind of done it all in my head. Um, I'm not on Strava. I couldn't get my damn watch to connect, so I'm like, I'm over it. Um, so, and so I had my little Casio, my, you know, my little time, um, and that's all I really need. Wow. It's crazy. What's, what's ironic is when I was on the Appalachian Trail, um, I, I, you know, I read, well, I had a Garmin watch that could tell me distance and all that stuff, but I just kept it on time of day. I had say eight miles to the, to the next stop, my crew pit stop. I could tell them spot on how long it would take me to get there. And I would be like that. Well, within within a minute or two, seriously, um, every single time that I was on autopilot. Mm -hmm. So data, data is, I think, it's really good if you're in a controlled environment. I think it's very important. Cycling cyclists use it a little more, maybe with heart rate monitors too. But but not my kind of running. It's just I run up and down the mountains. You know, um, it's hard when you go uphill and it's a lot easier going down. Yeah, so, you know, it's always okay to push up because your impact is lower. You're not running your body, but then running downhill, I think it's you practice to run fast downhill, but you shouldn't do it all the time because you're you're pounding your body and putting yourself more injury risk. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're going to talk. I'm going to ask you a little bit more now about the um, Appalachian Trail record. Um, in 2016, um, like you say, nearly 2,200 miles over 14 states, um, and you did it in 45 days, 22 hours, and 38 minutes. Um, how on earth do you prepare for something? You know like that what was what did your training look like you know running based and perhaps non-running based you know what what did you do to get yourself ready for that massive challenge right so to get ready for the at my, obviously my base mileage over all the years is is solid right so i didn't do anything majorly specific for to 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 on the running side of things that might sound crazy i mean i was running probably 60 to 70 miles a week for multiple weeks before that or multiple months before that really but I didn't run a race. My, my last race, I think, that year was, it was in like March. So I had four, four or five months of just going running every day in the mountains. Um, and that's really what the AT is, is running in the mountains, right? Or basically hiking fast in the mountains. But on a, on a, well, what I did in preparation for 2016, though, is more than any other year, is I did more recon for my crew because your crew is, is super duper important. Number one, they can't get lost. You know, I mean, they can't miss you, which that happened anyway, I think two, twice. I resolved, but they can't miss you. They need to know you, what I want. Um, 
whether it's, you know, food, things like that, uh, how to, how to be really efficient with like for the crew, it was like getting me out in the morning at 5 AM every day and then, you know, finishing whatever time I finished. But I drove up, I drove down that trail in my own car. I went past every single, uh, road crossing. It took me like a month and a half to do it on my own. So I drove my Subaru to the East coast a couple of miles. I started, I actually started in Virginia, went south. And then I drove all the way back to, then I went back to, went back to Virginia, ran a hundred mile race and then drove up to Maine and came back down and then I drove home. So the recon that I did was really important. I, I showed where all the, all the grocery stores were, where the gas stations were, where the, you know, where this road might, it might be closed or whatever and stuff like that. So, so my wife's just got home. So, um, <laughs> That was just something that we did more preparation. Uh, and I had the right crew people. Eric Bell is the guy with the beard in the movie. Um, good old friend of mine. He used to live at my house, so he knows me very well. And my wife, Cheryl, was there. She came three different times to crew me. Um, and my dad, you know, my dad obviously was a, was really important to, he just had to follow the white van. And he did some dirty work, but he loved it. So um, it wasn't really about the running as much. It was really about, just the crewing stuff. And, you know, if you ask any AT through hiker, um, what happens on the AT is that after three to four weeks, they say you'll get your trail legs and you sort of get used to just getting up and grinding every day. I mean, never was, ne not one day were my legs really sore. That might sound crazy, right? Even from the beginning, first day I did 60, 60, 62 miles from the first day because the way logistics were. And I wasn't really sore after that day. I just like, I kind of kept grinding it and grinding it and eventually it just everything becomes automatic. And so after three weeks, as long as you're not injured after three weeks, because that'll happen often too, um, your shins get really hammered. Uh, but if you can get through that first period, the first month or so period or three weeks, um, your body tends to adapt. And then you just, it's just the daily grind every day. You know, um, Jerick said the same thing. It's just like, you're not really sore. You're tired, of course. Uphills are a little slower. You know, you don't run fast downhill. You can't. You are just you find this autopilot, and that's what happened with me for a while. And then, and after three weeks, I was injured too. And I, I sucked it up and got through it in Pennsylvania. My shins were a mess, and I lost a lot of time. I mean, I thought my time could have been much faster, actually. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it happened, but I ground through it. Um, and again, my body adapted to that injury, and it was my shins, and they kind of get better after a week and they didn't really hurt. But even now, my shins, they're fine now, but uh, every once in a while, a little overuse and they kind of crop back up. So I think the AT actually had a big thing to do with that three years later. Yeah. You think that, but that's just how it is. But yeah, no, no real super special training. Just, uh, just focus on the crew stuff was most important. Yeah. And um, what would you say, um, you know, thinking about the challenge itself, um, what were some of the highlights from that, you know, from that amazing experience? Well, one of the highlights is obviously is, is having my dad out there because I, you know, my, parents, my parents live in New Hampshire. I live in Utah. So I don't see my parents all the time. You know, that was really cool. Um, highlights of the trail, Maine and New Hampshire are amazing. I, they're just super, it's super hard. Uh, it's just technical, but you get vistas above the, the tunnel, the green tunnel, so to speak. But then at the same time, the green tunnel is also the beauty of the trail, is that it's always just woods, you know. Um, having Eric Bells, again, the guy with the beard, on, along with me, he's, again, he's like one of my best friends, and he was special to have along. Uh, these were all just, you know, Scotty Jura coming along, Dave Horton popping in there, um, seeing people like – sort of cheering you, which I'm thinking I'm only moving four miles an hour, but it's really special when people come out to see you. Like that. Yeah. Um, of course, my wife popped in. One time my wife popped in. I didn't, I didn't know she was coming. It was a place called, called uh, Pettit's Gap in Virginia. And I had been having a really crappy day. My, my left foot, and if you remember in the movie when I was poking my foot, um, it was that, that, that same day actually. I climbed up with another guy named Jay, John Basham and I got to the van and I sat down. I was like, oh, finally, it was dark. And I looked over my left, and I'm like, oh. And, my, and Cheryl, my wife, was sitting there, you know. That was pretty cool. That was that was pretty highlight. Um, 
And then, you know, just getting to the end was a highlight. I was wondering what I was going to do when I was, when I was done. The next day, I kind of wanted to be back on the trail again. Yeah. It's as painful as it was. That sort of was the feeling. Yeah. I do today, you know. Incredible. Um, and so, you mentioned that you had some um, trouble with your um, shins. Um, was that kind of, the, you know, the real low light of it? Were there any other periods that were, you know, really bad? Uh, yeah, there were a couple. Yeah, the, the shin when the shins happened, I was on a flat trail in New Jersey, so they were really they were tight and maybe a little sore before that, but they were they weren't really any problems. All of a sudden, I was walking on a flat, the flattest, easiest probably mile of the AT. Um, all of a sudden, it's sort of like that guitar string broke, yeah. right? I was like, oh, you know, like I'm like, oh, there it is. So in my head at that time, that was the first low point. And then from, from that point on, the next, I think, seven or eight days, um, I mean, I had to go through the rockiest section, which is uh, New York, New York, Jersey, and Pennsylvania are really rocky. I mean, you think they're the lower part, but it's, it's nasty. Mm. That was pretty low. But then as I sort of, my shins got better, I was in an area called, uh, it's near Richmond, Virginia, McAfee Knob, a very popular place on the AT, probably the most photographed place on the AT. Uh, I had to sleep in the woods overnight, and my buddy Eric, he, he brought my stuff in, we slept on the trail, he brought food, everything was fine, but I really, did, I guess I didn't sleep very well that night, and I got up the next morning, and I just had zero in the tank. I was so tired, and so after walking very slowly for like a mile, I said, Bells, it's Eric Bells, like, Bells, I said, I'm going to take a nap on the trail, he'll wake me up in 20 minutes. So he, he, blew up my, he went ahead, blew up my thermo rest, my pad that I had been sleeping the night before, and I laid in the trail for 20 minutes. But it took me to go 10 miles to the van, it took me like five hours. And that was like, and it was, wasn't really a particularly hard part of the trail. It was fairly smooth, hilly, but fairly smooth. That took forever. When I got to the van, I just crawled in the van about 10.30 in the morning, and I was just like taking a nap. And I took a nap for a couple hours after a few um not unsuccessful motivational speeches from my dad and from everyone else. I'm just like, you know, leave me alone. I, uh, I kind of, I'm like, I kind of tell myself, like, don't give up. Don't, this isn't the end, you know, don't give up. So I just sort of like started walking down the trail. I didn't tell my dad or Cheryl or Eric that I left. So all of a sudden I was missing, which was stupid. But at the time I was like, whatever. So I started walking down the trail, and then, then I was missing for the crew, and they knew where the next stop was, which was about five miles down the trail to a road crossing. And so I started walking, and slowly, and then eventually my wife came backwards towards me and saw me. So then I was, they knew where I was, you know. That was a real low day. That was a horrible day. And like, I gave all these miles back that I was gaining ground on. And, uh, you know, the next morning I woke up, and I was still kind of in a bad funk where my Cheryl went with me that morning and we got in sort of a, I'm not going to say we got in a fight. It was all me. I was just being a jerk. <laughs> uh, you know, she almost turned around. And I'm like, no, just come, no. I'm like, just come with me. And she did. And then I sort of, I sort of bounced back. Like all of a sudden it started to like come back to me and it started clicking again. And I then it was like, oh, the next day was like 60 miles or something. Then I started cranking out again. So that's, those are like the major lows that you have to talk yourself through. And that was, I mean, that stretch was brutal. But I knew once I got further down the trail again, then I started getting closer and closer to the end of Virginia, which is like 600 miles long, super long state. You never feel like you're out of it. It all looks the same. And uh, once I reached that point, I was like, all right, I can start to smell the barn. And I knew that if I, I knew I wouldn't really, as long as I didn't screw anything up or got hurt, then I could, then I'd have a chance to get the record. And, uh, you know, I just kept grinding it out. Six days left, five days left, four days left. And then Scotty Jurek showed up, you know, and he did a he did some good stuff too. He brought um, he brought I slept overnight in the woods with him in Smoky Mountain National Park too one night. He lugged stuff in for me, and that was a really pivotal day too because I gained an extra 16 miles on the trail that I wouldn't otherwise have gotten because of logistics. So you know, those things are special. I mean, friends like that, and I you know, and I was breaking Scott's record at that time too. So if you think about that, that's like another you know we're all friends kind of thing. Yeah. yeah there's there's plenty of low times i mean but i try to keep smiling uh, and um i love that most of your highlights are about the people that you know the people that you got to share it with that's mm -hmm. that's really lovely to hear um 
so we're talking before about your um your training and how it generally looks because basically you're kind of always in training for an upcoming 100 mile race aren't you <laughs> yeah, there's no off season for yeah. me actually. Another one and then I go do it. Yeah. yeah so you said that you would you know roughly speaking about 20 percent of your training would be you know hard effort and then um do you do anything um non-running do you do any cross training or any resistance training anything like that oh go <laughs> <laughs> I go um, no, I, I don't really, and that's and it's not, it's not that it's not like I go run, I come home, take a nap, and do nothing. Though I I like doing things at my yard, so this isn't you know what I put on someone's training schedule, obviously. But but I move around a lot. I'm a mover, so um, I'm moving rocks around, raking this. I just find something to do all the time. So for me, that's good enough for me. Um, it's not a bad idea to do strength training. I'm, I'm not saying those are bad. They're, they're totally good. Yeah. At the same time, you don't necessarily need that to be the best runner. I, I think to be a good runner, you got to run. That's what's most important. Try to listen to your body. Keep yourself from getting hurt. I haven't had too many injuries over my entire career that really stopped me from running. Um, I've had knee surgery. I've had meniscus surgery in 2016 at the AT, but that didn't even hold me back that long. Um, a bulging disc in 2000, that held me back for a while. Um, that's pretty painful. You don't want that. Um, but generally speaking, I try to keep myself from getting hurt. And if I don't get hurt, then everything else sort of falls into place for me. Yeah. So, yeah, so your kind of um, everyday life, you know, chopping wood and laying slabs and whatever is, you know, yeah, kind of your strength. Yeah, like something, you know. I'm always doing something. Yeah. Um, okay. So thinking about um, 100 mile race days, um, are there any specific actions that you, that you do to make sure, you know, to try and execute your race in the best possible way? I mean, obviously you've done so many of them now. There must be certain things that you do as mm -hmm. standard every time. I think the week, the week before uh, any, any race really, but you want to make sure that you're getting enough sleep. Uh, if, you know, you might work. So it's just, for instance, say you work Monday, you know, Monday through Friday, you work nine to five. Um, it's important to get your sleep hours in and because your body basically recovers from sleep faster than any other way. So, but the night before a race, I mean, I don't have a special diet like where I'd eat this before a race because 100 miles, I'll eat whatever my normal diet. I'll, I'll, you know, if we have to go out to dinner and have a cheeseburger and fries, I'll eat a cheeseburger and fries or pizza or whatever. Um, but on race, the, the night before a race, it's important to eat dinner early so you take care of the next morning on time. And then, uh, you know, just in the next morning, just eat a lighter breakfast, and then you kind of go do it. And I'll, and I'll run the whole race on gel. So I'm, I'm also very simple. I don't have a complex diet during the race. It's like gel and water and salt, salt caps of some sort, uh, usually salt stick. So other than that, it's really I, – I keep things as simple as absolutely possible. A lot of times people will have spreadsheets and times and splits and what they're going to eat at mile 75 will – you don't know what you're gonna eat at mile 75. Not if it's regular food. If you're going gel across the board, and if you can do it, then that's it's easier, you know. You can't really you can't really say I'm gonna have a a, a bar and 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 two potato chips, you know, it just doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't nothing really specific other than just be keeping it real simple with gel. You can really keep track of the calories you're you're taking in too, like that. Even if you're drinking say a, a, a sports drink, a nutrition drink, even when you drink that, it's more complicated to know the n number of calories you're taking in. Like two to 250, like two, probably 250 an hour is about my norm. So a gel over 25 minutes or so is about right. And it, you know, people say they can't stomach the gels. Well, you can stomach the gels. The problem is with regular food or regular real food, you can often eat too much. And if, if you're putting that in, that too much food into your funnel, it doesn't go down the funnel, so it comes back up. And once it's coming back up, then you start losing all your electrolytes, you lose your hydration, and everything becomes a mess. So if you can really just keep your, your food intake on a timer, you know, nibble and sip, sort of, so to speak, um, it makes it a lot easier. In theory. <laughs> yeah yeah because a lot a lot of people, to say sometimes but yeah a lot of people when i ask them about you know mistakes and things one of the things they first say is nutrition getting that wrong <laughs> Well, that's the hardest part, you know, it really is. I mean, you don't just, my first, my first Wall Street 196, I had a, a pack with six of those really old power bars. I don't know if you remember those or not, but 
in the 90s, Power Bar made these bars and they were these, you know, you could crack them. If it was cold, you crack them. You needed an ax to chop them in half, right? Well, I started with six of those things thinking I was going to eat that. So the first 40 miles, well, I ate half of one, you know. And I think I might have eaten a little bit of nibbles off the tables. I didn't know what salt was even for. Um, so I learned the hard way, as I said before. Uh, but nutrition is the hardest thing. And that's why I really, once I figured I can do all these races on gels, I think the most gels I had in a race is like 57. A lot of gels are hard rock 100. So uh, if you can do that, it makes it easier. But it takes it takes a few races to learn. You don't just if you nail your first race, then congrats to you. But you got to learn that one sort of by doing. I can recommend the number of calories, which is you know about two two fifty. Um, just don't overstuff yourself. Um, that's that's the biggest mistake I think people make. It's not a it's not a hundred mile buffet. Eat all you can. It's you kind of eat to sustain your your energy, as opposed to shoveling everything in there and thinking that's going to be good because your body won't process. Gels are made to be processed very quickly, right? Yeah. Cheeseburger isn't. I had a guy who ran a 100 miler, same one I ran a couple weeks ago, and I asked him how he went with his nutrition, and he said, I had two Chick fil A sandwiches, which are chicken sandwiches at like mile 60 or something. And I was like, huh? I'm so I'm like, and how'd you feel after that? Well, it's kind of sluggish. Well, no shit. <laughs> so anyway, you know, you, you got to figure it out yourself. Um, but whatever you do is just try to keep it as simple as possible. Yeah. Don't make yeah. it complicated. Um, okay. And, um, we mentioned it, well, you mentioned earlier, um, about, you know, you could probably get off, get up off the couch and go and get through a hundred miler pretty much at any time because of a lot of it being what's up here. Um, what can you tell us about the strategies that you use, you know, mental strategies that you use to help you get through a race? Any specific techniques that you use when, it, you know, you're deep in the pain cave and it's really hurting? Well, I, I'll always tell myself when I'm hurting that it can't always get worse because my career has been long and I've had a lot of races where I don't really feel so good at mile 20. I'm like, oh man, this is going to be a long day. But then you just kind of stick with your strategy, your plan of eating the gels and the water or whatever. And sometimes I've had my best miles between 70 and 90, you know, like really late in the race after you've had low patches early. So you it's Dave Horton's line, not mine, where it doesn't always get worse. It's one of the greatest lines ever because he's done the AT. He held the record on the AT. He knows what it feels like. And you can get out of that cave, you know. Sometimes it takes slowing down for a little while. Sometimes you have to accept the fact that, well, I'm having problems right now. I just have to slow down slow down a little bit, you'll process your food a little bit better, you know, a little bit easier. The faster, the harder you're going, the harder it's going to be to process your food. So you can back off a little bit and accept the fact, well, maybe this isn't going to be my personal best today. But you know when you get to the finish line that you'll be happy, you know, even if it wasn't your best day. I've finished plenty of hundreds where I kind of walk, I, mean, I think at Hard Rock one year, I walked like the last 30 miles, right? I was in fourth or fifth place. I was doing great where I was. And I just kind of like, someone put a couch on my back somehow and I had to carry that thing all the way to the finish line, it seemed like. But, I, but, but instead of dropping out, you know, and going home with my tail between my legs, I walked to the finish. I got there, you know. And I was proud of myself for finishing because, you know, I didn't go there to drop out. And I wasn't injured. I mean, it's one thing if you're injured, but if you're not injured, there's no reason you can't at least keep walking forward, you know. We want to forward progress. Yeah, you know? yeah. The line too is that... You can get there even if you feel bad for a while. Yeah. You know, your body your body adapts. Yeah. Walk if you have to, crawl if you must, isn't it? Something like that. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Exactly. I mean, you, you, it is between your ears. A lot of people will drop out of races, and it's so in their head that they drop out, and the next day you see them going for a jog. You know, they, they did say 60 miles of a 100 mile, or the next day you see them jogging down the road. Oh, well, why did you drop out, right? Because in their head they were like, oh, I just want to go home. At, at Wasatch here, there's an aid station about mile 70, which is it's in Brighton, Utah. And it's a classic place. It's indoors, so it's warm. Typically, the race is that's the coldest place. People go inside, they get a little warm. It's only a 20-minute drive back home, and they bug out. And a lot of those times, it's people that, that bug out there because you know, it, was it was either close to home or it was warm. They just don't want to go suck it up the last 25 miles. And... And they feel bad about it the next day because they didn't finish, you know. 
it's, it, it's just all in your head. You just got to talk yourself out of it. Yeah, yeah. How will, how will I feel tomorrow if I if I do give up? Is is quite a good incentive. It, it doesn't feel good, you know. I mean, I've dropped out a few times too, and it's not. You don't feel good about it. You know, like, why didn't I just keep going? You know, I feel fine, I feel fine now. You know, yeah. and I happened in '99 at Hard Rock. I dropped out at mile '92, and I was leading the race like all day, and I just had a, a really bad descent from a place called Buffalo Mine and my shins were killing me and my body, I'm sure I was hurting, you know, no doubt. But a buddy of mine who was pacing me, which I don't do that anymore, but he was pacing me, he's like, you should save yourself for Wasatch if you're hurting that much. And I was, which was two months later. And I was just like, he talked me right into that. Mm. And he's still one of my best friends, see him every week. But that conversation was like, he sort of talked me out of like, just suck it up, dude. Just because you got passed and you're in second place now, doesn't mean you have to stop. Yeah. Right, motivational words to keep me going. Yeah. <laughs> blame it on him. But, you know, that sort of, that got into my head. It's like, all right, I'm out of here. You yeah. Know, sit down and pick me up. And that was totally mental. I only had was one more climb. And it was a tough climb. But one more out of 11 massive climbs at, you know, high altitude. So it's, you can get past it. And now after that happened, I was like, you know, I've dropped out of a few races too, but after that, still, but most of them are all in my head. Only twice I've really dropped out of a race because of injury. So those are acceptable. But. Yeah, yeah, that's a bit different. Yeah. Um, and can you just give us a quick um, rundown of um, what you rely on in terms of clothing and gear, you know, when you're, when you're doing your races? Anything that you, you can't be without? Well, uh, I'll start at the bottom, I guess. Uh, shoe, I've always liked soft shoes, softer shoes to run in. So, and in my initial beginning of my career, it was always called the Montreal Vitesse, and it's, I mean, it's 25 years ago. Only some old, old guys will remember those things, but they were great. They were soft. I liked them. Um, but now I run for Hoka on and, uh, you know, obviously I have a Speed Goat shoe, which is my signature shoe that they worked. I worked with them to make that happen. Obviously, I wear those. Um, Primax socks are great. They're just, they whip water out great, you know. But again, I'm not, I'm not complicated, just shorts. I have a waist pack. I don't like vests because vests uh, are kind of warm. They can be, if it's a hot day, vests can be warm. So the waist pack, I really think that's the best place to carry water as far as weight on your body because it's right on your pelvic crest, right? As opposed to up here. Handhelds I don't like because the further away from your body they are, the heavier they get, you know, the pendulum, right? So I try to keep everything close to my body and accessible, and that's via the waist pack which is, we have a Speedgoat waste pack from Ultraspire too. So I've sort of like created the brand of Speedgoat on my, on my own terms. Uh, but you know, my Oka shirt is just a simple, super lightweight shirt. Uh, and then it, just a light jacket. Most races, like you know, a lot of European races, they make you carry some more stuff. You, know, you have to pay your pants and all of those things. I've only run, I'd run UTMB twice. And the years that I ran UTMB, but we, we had to require leggings, we, we carried pantyhose. And that was acceptable. So they were small, you know, it was a tiny little ball. Now it's a little different. So all the races I've run, I really haven't had to carry much stuff. But I carry the minimal amount too. I don't, I don't have an extra um, container of, of squirrels nut butter in me. If I need that, I'll get it at the aid station. I don't carry this extra stuff. My gels are stuffed in my pockets. My shorts have little pockets on the side. And then my, my waist pack has a few pockets as well. So I carry my electrolytes in my front pocket. I have a little garbage pocket. My gels are basically in my pockets of my shorts and two water bottles on my back. And, you know, if needed, I'll carry like a super lightweight jacket just for high weather, you know, altitude stuff um, and colder weather. But that's really about it. And it's worked for me. Um, but again, that's sort of weather dependent. I mean, if weather's going to be ugly, you can carry more crap. But I would do the most possible. Too much people, the further, you know, it's, Further back in the pack you go, the heavier people's packs are. Yeah. Which is which, you know. But sometimes you'll see people in the back of the pack, and their pack you pick up their pack, and they're, it weighs like, you know, five, eight, ten pounds. Yeah. Think about that. That's that's the couch on their back, mm -hmm. right? Extra total extra weight. So if you can thin that out a little bit, um, that's the best tip: is to not carry. You think you need all this stuff, but you really don't need all this extra stuff. My wife has finished a race with 12 or 14 gels in her, in her back. So, 
carrying his stuff for. <laughs> See, those of us, those of us at the back, with carrying all that stuff that are out there for three times as long as you guys are the real heroes. <laughs> you know, well, yes, you know, you're carrying all this extra weight. I don't get it, but, but uh, then the comeback is always, "Well, I might have needed it. I might have needed this. I might have needed that." But you know, yeah, she just, I, would, I don't know what I'm going to be hungry for. Well, you put in there, put enough stuff in there, and eat what's there. Yeah, no, I'm with your wife on this. I think but you should be prepared. <laughs> well, and, and it's okay. Yeah, I get it, you know. But, um, and, you know, another way I learned a little about that, too, is so I hiked the long trail with Eric Bells this last summer. And what's typical for AT through hikers, and we, so the long trail is 20 days. So you're, it's a through hiker thing. But our packs, you know, after we were stopped the first time after five days, first thing we did was get rid of this, 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 this and that, because we didn't need it. We adapted to going with as little as possible. Once you learn how to adapt to that, then you know you don't need that extra body of bite, or you don't need that extra pair of socks that you're carrying. You just tuck it up. You, know, you have drop bags, and you can, you can use your drop bags, you know, to, when you get there, you can change them out if you want to, but you don't need all that extra stuff. So we're coming towards the end now. Um, I'm going to ask you now, um, what is the best piece of um, ultra running advice you've ever received? I've ever received? Um, well, I mean, the old cliche is don't go out too fast, but run your own race. You know, I think, I don't know if I really received that from someone else, but that's my best tip to someone is run your own race because it's so, especially in the front of the pack when you're racing at the front, it's so dynamic where someone can go out and be so far ahead of you. You can have an hour on you with 20 miles to go and you can catch them 10 miles later because they have that bad patch. So you really have to run your own race and try to keep smiling, you know, and remember that it's going to hurt. No kidding. You I mean, if you think you can do a hundred miles and not be painful, you're kidding yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to accept challenges of, of you have to accept those challenges that it's going to be painful. You, know, you can, you can hire a coach and, and go through training can be absolutely perfect. But that doesn't mean you're going to not hurt the whole race. Hurt by the end, and you went too slow. <laughs> it's it's all about, um, but keep smiling, you know, because who gets to do this stuff, right? You know, so em embrace it, you know. I mean, live once, die later. Yeah, and so the next question I was going to ask you actually was, what advice would you give to any of our audience who might have just booked their first hundred miler or just thinking about booking their first hundred miler? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the goal is to finish too. It's not the first time, especially don't make, don't make a time goal. Even if it's dead flat and you think you might have a ballpark because I've always looked at the hundred milers, three fifty milers. So it doesn't take as long as three fifty milers, but the second half is very different than the first 50. You're going to get slower. You're going to slow down. It's going to hurt more. Your belly might tweak out. But, uh, you know. And what about if anybody's watching who's um, perhaps, you know, already an established ultra runner and they've done um, several hundred miles already, but they're keen to take their performance to the next level. I mean, do you think, you know, what would be your advice to them? Do you think a coach is invaluable? How do you think it's best to sort of make progress? Well, I, I think you've got to do your homework. I think as a coach, a lot of times, I mean, I have a fair number of clients and those who do their homework and report to their coach and tell them what they're doing, how they're feeling is really important. Uh, and that isn't, not everybody does that. Uh, I think they should, but um, take advice from, you know, don't be afraid to ask someone who just won the race what they did and learn from it. Another great tip too, is to go work an aid station. If you work an aid station, okay, and, and it doesn't matter, if be, you know, maybe later in the race is probably better because you'll get to see what everybody does. See what the lead runners do, you'll see that their pack is very small, and as they get bigger as they go on, but you'll but you'll watch what people do, and you can really learn from from that. I think a lot of people waste a lot of runners, well, not the best runners, but a lot of people waste a lot of time in stations. You know, I've if I run a hundred miler, if I have more than twenty minutes at a max for downtime, that's a lot for me. Twenty minutes is a lot. People from middle to the back, hour and a half to two hours is very common. Sometimes more. If you break that down, as a fast guy who's done it for a while, break, start, start looking into your downtime. You, know, you don't need five people to crew you. Two, if you're going to have a crew, two people is optimal. One guy drives the car, the other guy navigates. You know, that part of it. Uh, and each person has a role. 
uh, if you're by yourself and you don't have crew, then you just, what, I, what I've done is in the past is we used to, I'd write something on my arm, little notes on my arm. I used to write notes on the back of our runner numbers. And so to remind yourself what to do, just like it would be grab gels, fill water bottles, dump garbage, grab my head lamp or something like that. Very, very simple instructions, but you've got to keep it as simple as possible and, and minimize your downtime. Because that downtime is like three, is like three months. You know, if I have my best downtime at Hard Rock is 16 minutes, at Hard Rock, which is not much, right? The next guy behind me that year, I think, was what 45 or something, which is still pretty good at Hard Rock. But that was a, I bought a half an hour of time by that, yeah, because I was more efficient. Yeah, they're not, they're not so much about speed. It's, any of the elite guys can run with the other elite guys at 100 mile speed, but how efficient you are at eight stations can really, really break time. It can really take time down. And when you run in at a station with another guy and you run out and he's two minutes behind you, you're out of his sight. And he doesn't know where you are. So then he's racing and he's working harder to catch you. Yeah. That's a strategy too that, it's, that I've used over the years that's really worked for me. And do you enjoy that side of it? You know, the sort of, the sort of um, tactical sort of, you know, that side of it. The racing, you That's know. The most fun part, this most fun part of ultra running is the tactical stuff. Yeah. Like, like just the, like I said, the aid station stuff. You know, I come behind you and leave before you every single time. You know, like that. You know, um, it's it happened at U100 this year. I came into an aid station. The guy who was, was five minutes in front of me, he was sitting there when I came in. I just went da 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 da, did my stuff in a minute, and I left. And then I beat him by 45 minutes. Right. Nice. Uh, and that was at mile 75 or something like that. So. It just goes to show you that you know you can mentally work your other your other guys a little bit. Um, I don't want to tell too many strategies like that. You know? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> right, but 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 uh, but that's mental. And again, it's like I said, kids keep saying it's between your ears, but those little things, those little nuances, sometimes can uh, kind of demoralize your opponents. Yeah. On way because we'll be drinking beers afterwards all together anyway. Yeah. I'll talk about it later, but yeah. that de factor has really made my career a lot better. Once you get that, is it four more wins to get that world record? How many more do you need? Well, it'll be five because I have to pass it, right? So, so once, you've, once you've got those five. I need five more, and we'll, we'll see. I mean, again, if I don't, do, if it doesn't happen, I'm not going to go home crying. You know, it's fine. Yeah. I've had an amazing career. I live in a dream world, and I've got nothing to complain about. Yeah. Um, okay, finally, um, now obviously you're, you, you know, you're a coach and you're working with um, other athletes. Um, what would be a couple of principles that you work from and pieces of advice that you would give every client, regardless of their experience, their level? You know, what would be a couple of things that you would always use as underlying principles? Well, if you're being coached, talk to your coach. <laughs> That's really important. Do your homework. Tell, you know, listen to your body. If you're really not feeling it, um, try to figure out why. You know, try to figure out why am I not feeling so good? Have I not slept well this week? Sleep is a huge factor um, with, with training. A lot of people, like I said, they work full time and they get to bed late or they have kids and pick them up at school and all that stuff. You've got to, you've got to, learn, to learn that rest is your friend also. Um, you can train hard, 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 but eventually that's going to catch up to you. So you have to learn how to rest, learn how to run easy, which is kind of a weird thing to say, but. That's just something that I think a lot of people don't understand, that rest is, rest is your friend. Um, don't know, I'm sorry, and don't overtrain. You know, I mean, overtraining is, is a misconception. We see a lot of, we've seen a lot of elite runners come into the sport and absolutely kill it, but then we see them disappear three years later, and mostly because it's overtraining. You know, they'll, they'll pound out. I'm not going to bring up any names, but – because there's a few out there, but at the same time, uh, overtraining is is your nemesis. It can it can really kill you, and it becomes too much of a job. You know, try to make try to make it fun, try to make it uh, enjoyable, and sometimes that means resting and do something else. You know, like turn turn off the turn off the running shoes for a day or two when you're really tired. And it's just it's, you gotta find something else to do because guaranteed you're gonna be like you know, you're addicted to running. So like I. I I feel bad that I didn't go today, but it actually would do you a favor. So that's something that just remember that rest is important. 
that's good advice yeah um okay i think that just about brings us to the end um thank you so much for joining us today carl for sparing us some time um it was really interesting to talk to you um and we'll add all the links uh, under the interview for people to be able to follow you online um and to see what 2020 brings and beyond um best of luck next week all right well thanks laura we'll see how it goes yeah or yeah take care thank you for joining us carl right.